Okay, kiddos, today we're going to talk about patterns that we find in resonance. If you remember, in, our, in a couple of videos ago, or in the first video for resonance, we talked about what resonance was, why it was necessary. Remember that resonance is merely the, like the best way that we can represent structures that are in line structures, the best way that we can represent their actual reality, because line structures are an imperfect model for that. And that's one of those things you need to learn in science anyway, is that we build models for things that are incomplete representations of what they actually are because they work and because sometimes you can't make the reality fit easily into a model. So that's what resonance is. In the second video, we talked about the curved arrow structure. Remember, we're showing where uh, we were showing if, if electrons were to move, how that would affect where the double bonds were, where the charges were, and all of those things. Because remember that one of the ideas behind resonance is to provide a stabilizing force for the molecule by sort of spreading out the charges. Okay, so that's the idea behind it. That was the last video. So if you remember at the end of the last video, I gave you a structure and I said, okay, this is resonant. And so now do stuff from that. Okay, so what we're going to talk about in this video then is how to recognize some of the patterns um, that will um, should immediately click in your brain and say, hey, this is a resonance structure. I can figure out what the other structures are once I know that it is resonant. Okay, so in this case, what we have here is we have an allylic cation, okay, an allylic positive charge. It doesn't have to be on a carbon, like this is an allylic carbocation, which, by the way, is what we sort of started off some of our resonance stuff from. It doesn't have to be that. It could be another atom. But in this case, this is a carbon, so that would be a carbocation. Remember that it's allylic because it is one carbon removed from where the double bond is. If we were talking about this carbon or this carbon, then that, those would have been vinylic or vinyl carbons. Okay, so one space removed is an allylic carbocation. This, by the way, is also an allylic carbon, but it doesn't have a carbocation on it, so that's not really part of what we're worried about for the resonance here. So if we know that the, having an allylic positive charge leads us to resonance, then what does the other structure look like? So this is where your curved arrow notation and all of that stuff comes in pretty handy. So we're going to draw our resonant arrow, our double-headed arrow there. I'm going to put the general structure there because I know I can't break any single bonds, right? So that general structure is the same. And so what is going to go on is we're going to move a pair of electrons there. And remember, we're not actually moving the pair of electrons. It's all part of the resonance thing. And so what that means is our new structure has a double bond here. Okay. And then, so the question then becomes, where does the, the carbocation go? Where does the, the cation go? And it's going to go right there. Now, you could have to, you could recalculate the formal charges and all that stuff to figure out where that is. But essentially, remember that when you move the pair, it displaces the charge. And so you're going to be shifting the charge somewhere else every time that you move a pair. Um, that, by the way, would lead us to a case like the one I'm about to draw for you. So real quick, let's talk about another example of an allylic positive charge. So again, I've got a double bond, one carbon removed from that, there's a positive charge. That is an allylic carbon, allylic positive charge. That's a resonant structure. Now, what's going to make this one pretty interesting is that having double bond, single bond, and then double bond has a specific name. We call those conjugated systems. Um, we're going to talk a lot about conjugated systems this year. But what makes this interesting in this particular case for resonance is that while I can easily show the next resonance structure because I recognize the pattern, it actually has more than one structure for its resonance. And we've seen that a couple of times in the past, um, but we're going to show that real quick here just to make sure that you sort of know and can see a little bit about how the charge shifts. So we're going to shift the electron over here. That means that my first resonance structure then is going to look like, that's the basic shape, right? I've moved the double bond over here, okay? That means that that double bond is still there. I haven't done anything with it. And so the positive charge now shifts because since I moved this over, the positive charge is going to shift over and it's going to be there. Now that's not it though because I actually have a third possible resonance structure here, okay? Where do I get that third structure? Well, as you might imagine, again, I could cause this double bond also to shift. Again, curved arrow notation, which is going to give us this scenario where we've got here and here. And now, where has that positive charge gone? Well, it has now shifted over here. Okay? So, again, remember, and I keep hammering on this, none of these structures by themselves are correct. 
we would take them sort of as an amalgam of all of them together. What we'll see later on is that sometimes there's a more correct structure given a, a certain scenario. But for now, there's three possible resonance structures. Remember, to make this fully correct, we would put the brackets around each side of that. Okay? So that's pattern one, allylic positive charge. We'll try to run through the others a little quicker. So the second resonant pattern that you should recognize is the one that we sort of started off the whole resonance thing with, which was an allylic lone pair. I've got a double bond here, one carbon removed. There's a lone pair on the end of that. And so what are we going to do to show the other resonance structure? So you should immediately recognize that as a resonance structure. Again, that was sort of where we started with. Um, and so how do we then get that to happen and be able to show our lone pair? Well, here's the way this works. This is actually going to require two curved arrows, whereas the allylic cation only required one. So I'm going to shift this to here, meaning that I'm going directly to that carbon over there. And then I'm going to take my lone pair and I'm going to shift it over there. So two shifts, what does that then leave us with? Well, that leaves us with the second of our resonance structures. Okay, double bond here, lone pair over here. This is probably the type of resonance that you're a little bit more familiar with from Chem 1, which means, hey, if I'm not real sure what's really going on, chances are if I move the double bond somewhere, that's probably one of the resonance structures. That's sort of the way we talk about it in Chem 1. It's obviously a little bit more complicated than that, and hopefully as we go on, you recognize what's actually going on in that case. All right, so next pattern. All right, so pattern number three, lone pair, lone pair, next two are adjacent to a positive charge. So there's a positive charge here. And the next atom over, there's a lone pair there. That pretty much always indicates some sort of resonance. What do we do then for a resonance structure? Well, again, we're going to draw our resonant arrow. And then what we're going to do here is we're going to take that lone pair. Generally speaking, if you have lone pairs, they're pretty likely to be something that's going to shift or something that we're going to represent as shifting. Okay, so that's going to move to here. Okay, what is that then going to do to the situation? Well, we're then going to get, so after we, after we propose that, that shift there, so what does the new structure look like? Well, we've got our nitrogen. And over here, we now have a double bond, right? We've got that. The positive charge is going to have moved over there to the nitrogen, okay? And then that's going to leave us with a structure that we're sort of familiar with. Remember, we talked about one of the other videos, the nitrogen can conceivably have four bonds if it's got a positive charge on it, okay? So that's the third pattern. So pattern number four, we've got a pi bond between two atoms that have different electronegativities. Now, that case is going to come up a lot. Um, we've already, when we talked about functional groups, we talked about a whole lot about functional groups that were carbonyl groups, where you had an oxygen double bonded to a carbon. That situation sort of inherently lends itself to some resonance scenarios. Now, it doesn't mean that every time you see a carbonyl group that you're going to have to draw a resonance structure. It means that you need to recognize that there's a possibility that you might have to show some resonance. Okay, so what next? All right, so we, we recognize it as a resonance structure from our patterns, okay, pi bond, two things of different electronegativity. I'm going to then take, so I'm going to then take my double bond and I'm going to move that up to the more electronegative element there, which is the nitrogen. That then is going to leave us with this scenario. Okay, so there's our new resonance structure. We took this double bond, we moved it up here, made it a lone pair here. Again, a possibility there for the nitrogen is that it could have two lone pairs and two bonds. We've discussed that um, previously. That's pattern four. So our fifth pattern, much like um, our first one, is something that you should already be relatively familiar with. It's a conjugated ring. Remember that conjugated means that there are double bonds that are separated one space by, uh, by single bonds. So double bond, single bond, double bond, single, double, that all the way around. That, of course, is a benzene ring. That's the base of all of our aromatic compounds. And we, of course, walked through this one in the curved arrow scenario, curved arrow scenario anyway. So we shouldn't have too much of a problem of drawing the next one. In fact, at this point, you know, you're like, hey, I already know what the next one looks like. It looks like this, okay, which is true, but you should not neglect to go back and make sure that you put in your curved arrows so that you can actually show what's going on. They're an important part. At least one of the models needs to show that. Typically speaking, that's the one on the left. 
Okay, so that's residence patterns. Um, a little bit later on, we're probably gonna talk about how do I judge them? There's a lot of different things that could be residents. How do I, how do I know if one of the resonance structures is sort of what matters most for the scenario that we're talking about? And we'll do, certainly discuss that in class and probably in a video in the future as well. So thanks kiddos.